what would I actually wish that somebody shared with me during college about starting a company, the kind of struggles that we go through to do that. Um, so when I was kind of putting together a few things that I pulled from our recruitment text and through some of the client presentations, I kind of chose to share, yeah, the good stuff, the stuff that you'll probably hear from most people who start a company, but also some of the things that we've done really wrong and kind of some of the, the ugly that you go through in the process. Um, what I want to cover with you guys, I'll give you a quick background on myself, then I'm going to teach you a little bit about what we do. You know, it's a chance to get in front of young potential entrepreneurs and kids coming out of a very fantastic college. We'd love for you to know our brand a little bit more and what it is that we do. So we'll teach you a little bit about our company. And I will tell you that this is not the normal Silicon Valley sort of company. We're not a technology business. We're not a business that's trying to go for hockey stick growth like you hear all the time but we are uh, a very successful business. It's just a different type of model, and I'm gonna teach you a bit about that. So it should be something hopefully new that you guys haven't had in here before. Um, after that, we'll give you a little bit of um, kind of the story of how we started the company, and also some of the challenges that we went through right off the bat when we tried to launch our own company and started trying to build a customer base and a revenue stream. Um, after that, I'll tell you a little bit about kind of how things have gone in the first three years of business some of the challenges we had kind of in our infancy as a company, and then also some of the new challenges that we're facing today now that we've reached you know, past the 50 employee mark. Um, okay, so background on myself. Um, I am not your textbook entrepreneur. Um, I basically uh, went to college at UCSB, and my degrees are in aquatic biology and zoology. Um, so I have a very unconventional background for a CEO, and obviously um, really fun when we have new hires coming in to tell them that, um, that I'm the one running the company. Um, that being said, I will say that about halfway through my um, college degrees, I started my first company, and at the time it was really a matter of uh, necessity based on what I was doing in school, but um, it was kind of a hobby that turned into a business, and it was about a year into that small kind of personal business that I started actually making real money and I realized that I had more of a, a taste for business. And I still credit to this day kind of running a small, small business. You know, this was five employees in Santa Barbara as to kind of what gave me the foundation for the fundamentals of a larger corporation. Um, so that's a, a little bit of background on myself. I guess after college, um, I spent uh, six years in a technology company in the Bay. I started in sales down at the, the low level, just kind of closing contracts. Uh, with corporations. This company was predominantly a social media monitoring company. It was called Meltwater Group. And we essentially sold contracts to, you know, from anywhere from five to $30,000 a year in a software as a service model, which I'm sure you guys have heard of. Um, so I started kind of low level, bottom of the totem pole doing sales. Over a four year period of time, I kind of moved up the ranks. And then I started running West Coast operations for the group and had somewhere around 50 reports at the time. Um, it was somewhere around five years in that our company decided to launch a new division and that was a division doing search engine marketing and I got placed in charge of that. And that division is what it kind of really pulled me into the market that our company now operates in. And I'll tell you the story of how we went from being inside that internal large tech company and moving into our own organization. Okay, so metric theory, what are we? We're essentially an ad agency and a digital ad agency at that. And when I say uh, digital ad agency, this is not Mad Men style. This is this day and age where we are serving ads to you guys on the web on any channel that you can think of. Whether you're on Facebook, Instagram, Google, or all over the web on any sort of content site, we're running campaigns for large corporations to essentially help drive customers to their site. So the core of our business is what you'd call search engine marketing. Everybody knows this. You can tell we pulled the screenshot before they put out their new horrible logo. Um, but essentially, this is what we're doing. Uh, or this is what we're doing for our corporate clients. Is we're running text ads. Um, we also do on the right-hand side some simple image ads for them that are based on product feeds. These are essentially product-specific ads that we're running. And what's happening here is that we are trying to drive traffic to their customer sites to drive sales or lead form fill-outs. And the one thing about search uh, as a channel or a digital media channel is that it has uh, more power than pretty much any other advertising medium. And the main reason for that, and this is the reason why Google is the billion dollar juggernaut that they are, is because that at the point in time when we make a search on Google, we give up a certain piece of information that no other advertising medium has, and that's intent. When we are looking for something, at that moment when they can show us an impression, as a user you've said, hey, I'm looking for a stand-up paddleboard. 
and therefore the advertiser can serve an ad to the person who is at that moment searching for something that they have to offer. That's why Google is able to charge so much for their advertising and that's why their revenue streams are so high. What's fantastic for us and other digital agencies is that search performs fantastically well for our clients. People who, sites that sell direct products online, they oftentimes are seeing a 10, 15 to 1 return on every dollar in advertising on Google for revenue that's coming in. So this is a kind of the predominant piece of our business is managing paid search ads for large corporations. How does this game kind of work? To be honest, it's no longer the Mad Men world. It is a world of numbers. Digital advertising, you can track every touch point that you have with the user, and it all comes down to data. There is a slight amount of creativity that can come up in about 120 characters, but the rest of it, it's really data analysis and it's bidding methodology. So how does this work from the advertiser's perspective? Well, what you're doing is you're selecting keywords that you feel are relevant to the products that you offer. If you sell stand-up paddle boards, you're going to bid on keywords that essentially are anything to do with paddle boarding of any sort or any of the accessories that are around paddle boards. The other pieces that come with it is just managing budgets, testing different creative, testing landing pages, which is the pages that you go to after you click on an ad. But really, it's, it's data analysis. This interface, it's just a screenshot to show you guys. This is just one customer, but on average, our customers run 30 to 50,000 keywords. And each one of those has its own individual set of performance metrics, which is in every single one of these columns. So our world is very data-based, and the value we bring is to essentially run their campaigns more efficiently for their, uh, for their dollars spent. A few other things that we do, you guys definitely get exposure to this. This is remarketing and display. Display just generally refers to ads that are served to anyone that's out on a content site on the web. So if you're reading an article in the New York Times or something like that, a general ad that's shown up there, that's just a general display ad. The ones that people are starting to get more used to, but are also very effective, is what we call remarketing ads. And this is when you guys probably experience them all the time, but you're on a site shopping for some new pair of shoes, and all of a sudden you start seeing ads later in the week for that exact pair of shoes that you were looking at. This is where we've essentially tagged you and we're able to follow you all over the web. We know exactly what you viewed and we're able to show ads to remind you exactly what's in your shopping cart or what products you were actually looking at. It's a disgustingly effective advertising method. <laughs> okay. Um, also, this is getting bigger and bigger. Google's still doing a, a lot of work to justify the return on it, but we do do advertising on YouTube. These are the really obnoxious ads that show up where you have to wait for four or five seconds to skip them. They're called pre-roll ads. You'd be surprised they do an okay job at building brand recognition. They do an okay job at driving sales for customers. Um, but it is a kind of a big component for larger brands that we work with. Last, and probably my favorite, um, is Facebook. And why do we like Facebook so much? Because it's new, it's exciting, it's a new ad platform that is really evolving every single month. And it's really fun to watch kind of the slugfest between the juggernauts for every company's ad dollars. And that's what's happening right now for uh, Facebook versus Google. And what's different about Facebook, you know, and they have their markets a little bit different than search, but Facebook is still technically display advertising. So it doesn't have that intent that's given up with the user at that point in time. You think about a user on Facebook, a user's there on Facebook to essentially browse the content from their connection. Ads are kind of the last thing that they're generally looking for. Obviously, if a very targeted or relevant ad shows up, yeah, you might be able to win a click, but it's not the same as when you're on Google. When you're on Google, you're, if an ad shows exactly what you're looking for, you're very likely to click it. Facebook's not the same. But it is fun because it is a display ad again. It's an image ad, so there's a little bit more to the creativity side and the ability to attract the eye of a user. And they have a very different model by how they serve ads and how they're charging customers right now. Um, but honestly, for every single quarter we've had over the last year, we've been seeing about 5% of our budgets being siphoned over to Facebook accounts away from Google accounts. So it's an interesting trend in the market. Google's doing everything they can. I'm sure you guys remember when Google launched uh, G+. Everyone thought it was a big, giant failure. They even kind of shut it down. It actually wasn't at all for Google. It was a simple way to get as many people that had Gmail accounts as possible to register and give up basic demographic information the same stuff that Facebook uses to essentially target ads on their platform. If you were signing up for a simple account and you gave up your age, you gave up your sex, you gave up your birthday, that was a great starting point for Google to start making additional inferences on who you are as a person so that they could serve better ad products. Same sort of game. Okay, 
So that's really what we do for customers. We're a digital ad agency. We use a, uh, a myriad of different digital channels to essentially drive visits and sales for our customers online. Okay, so let's tell you um, some general background on the company. Oh, let's back up one. So we started in September of 2012. So honestly, last Friday we had a giant uh, birthday cake and we celebrated our third birthday. That was very fun for us. Um, we're about 50 employees. I think we're at 51 or 52 right now as of the last couple of hires we made. Um, but we, we've literally only been in business for three years. Right now we're at about 170 clients and we manage somewhere around $75 million a year in advertising dollars. Um, some of the clients, I'll show you guys a couple slides on who these corporations are that we work with and tell you a bit about kind of the niches that we operate in. Um, but we've kind of our, our notable ones. Yeah, we're basically generally servicing either e-commerce shops. So these are companies that are just selling products directly online. Whatever it is that you're buying these days, you know, you're looking for a new stand-up paddleboard. These are shops that are selling direct and shipping over the web. And that's a big chunk of our business. I think it's roughly 65% of our customers. The other half is either B2B technology companies or services companies. And more often than not, that uh, part of our customer base, they're obviously not selling million dollar servers over the web. They're basically trying to drive leads for their sales force. Right? So there it's more can the user actually fill out their information and say, hey, I want to talk to a salesperson. And then goes about closing a deal for you know, the million dollar server. So, a myriad of public companies that we work with. We've got a couple of big tech brands in Silicon Valley that everybody knows. Um, we in particularly try and target young startups that we find are really exciting. Why? Because we know if they really find success, they're going to have huge budgets down the road, and that's going to be big customers for metric theory. Um, you know, we've got people that... So, if we tell you about uh, a couple customers, the ones everybody's heard of, at least on the tech side, Citrix Systems, $5 billion tech organization. Trade, these two on the upper right over here, Trade King and MindBody, both IPO'd in the last three months. Um, they're decent sized, $500 billion cap companies. Um, but then we got kind of a wide variety of different tech businesses. And again, every single one of these businesses is either driving free trial signups to their platform because their software is a service model and they're kind of taking the freemium approach, or they're trying to drive leads because they're selling an enterprise product and those leads are essentially going to be serviced by salespeople and deals are going to be tried to close from there. The other chunk are e-commerce shops or large consumer brands. So the ones that probably everybody knows, what uh, Reef Sandals, the flip-flops, you know, every, pretty much everybody's seen that brand around. And, um, and Wet Seal, a lot of people have heard of that one. Lucy Activewear, I wasn't personally familiar with, but apparently it's Lou Lemon's biggest competitor. Um, Dean and DeLuca is a fairly large grocer in the East, uh, East Coast. And then you've got some of these really weird companies. Vogue Wigs, largest wig retailer online. <laughs> they honestly spend $200,000 a month in advertising, so well over $2 million a year, and they're a huge customer of ours. It's a giant business, it's a $20 million a year business. We've also got the largest cane retailer in the, uh, on the web. Spa Depot, this is a, essentially a spa um, hot tubs parts company. Again, huge advertising budgets that are driving a big chunk of revenue online. Um, I don't know, some people have heard of Benbridge Jewelers. You know, there's stand-up paddleboard companies. There's a company, Carvana, that's selling cars online now as a car vending machine. But you name it, it's kind of all over the map. Um, but this is about 65% of our customer base. These clients are driving direct sales on their site. What is interesting about these guys is that when they drive direct sales on their site, we can see every last drop of data we need to justify the investment in both our company and also their advertising dollars. Why? Because when somebody clicks on one of our ads, then goes to the site and then makes a purchase, that data is sent back to our platforms. And we can actually see, okay, you've spent $20,000 this month in advertising, and you've driven $120,000 in revenue. Do you have a question? Yeah, I was just gonna ask, do all of these companies spend their entire advertising budget with your company, or do they divide it between like different companies to get different um, parts? Here? It depends on the company. The ones that are just the straight e-commerce player, that they're not so much a consumer brand, generally their entire budget is under us. Um, things that are more like a Dean and DeLuca, or a Reef, or a Lucy, 
sometimes they'll have more of like a branding team and that team may do additional TV, radio, billboards, all of those sorts of things and we don't touch any of that, right? We're just kind of straight on the digital side. Okay, so that's essentially the, the, the background on metric theory, what we do. Let me tell you a little bit of how we started the company. So this is the slide we use in our recruitment deck. So this is kind of new incoming hires coming into, um, you know, hear about the company, how we started it, how we got to the size that we are. And I wrote a special slide for you guys after this that is essentially the real story. And we'll get to that in a minute. But what is um, the background in our company? Basically four of us founded the organization and we all worked at the previous company together doing the exact same thing. We built uh, the division that I was running at Meltwater. The last one was doing search marketing. And the four of us ended up starting a company together and leaving that organization to start our own business. So we basically had three, three and a half years together building the previous company. And then we went out on our own and started to build metric theory. We took zero funding. We had zero clients. We had a rule that we didn't call any of the old clients from the old business. And obviously when you have zero funding, that means you aren't hiring people and you aren't uh, starting in an office space. So we started in honestly the living room of my apartment in the Marina District of San Francisco. Those are the desks in the back corner of my living room. My girlfriend was really pissed about it for a couple months. Um, and this was two of the girls that started doing sales with us that came over from the old company, Amanda and Jenny. And literally the first 25, 30 customers of Metric Theory, they were signed either while somebody was sitting on my bed in the bedroom or sitting in one of the closets to hide from the noise of the engineers in the living room. And that's literally how we started the business. Um, oh, they do like to joke about the cat that harassed people while they were working as well. So that's how we started. We were in the uh, apartment for about four months um, before we kind of moved out into an office space. I will say you guys hear the starting in the garage kind of um, cliche startup story. We are a little different than that. Why? Because we didn't have to go through a lot of the initial struggles that a startup does. And when I say that, I mean predominantly technology startups you hear about in Silicon Valley. And why I say that is because more often than not, they spend their first year suffering through product development and really figuring out how to deliver the product or service that they're going to offer. And they burn a bunch of cash doing it. Well, because we came from a previous company, we already knew how to sell our product. We already knew how to service our uh, customers. And we, we knew what we were doing and we had at least the individual owners had a somewhat of a reputation in the space. So all we needed to do was actually get cracking on starting to scale and starting to try and acquire customers and get some revenue in the door. And we did that very rapidly. We were cash flow positive month two and we never looked back since then. That being said, I will tell you the, the bloody details of leaving a previous company and starting your own business. So the departure from our previous firm. And I really thought about, okay, how much of this story should I share? Should I scare people with it or not? But I honestly think that um, I wish I had heard a story similar to this prior to it actually happening to us. Because uh, if you look at my main partner, Adam, both of us are very cautious guys. We both always wanted to run our own company, but we're cautious and we're really nice. And I will tell you that nice really bit us in the ass in starting our company. And we learned a lot of mistakes, or learned from a lot of those mistakes, and anyone else that was going through what I was going through, I would give them very different direction than what we actually did in our process. So, what actually happened was that we built this other division inside another company. It's called Meltwater. And that company originally is only a technology player. The plan was we were going to resell software. We did that for a year and the customers started churning because they didn't know what they were doing with the campaigns even if you sold them a great software. So what happened? These people started asking us to run their campaigns. So we started inside that technology company building an agency and we did that for two and a half years. But that meant we were hiring more and more people to actually manage these accounts. And basically about two and a half years in, the CEO of that tech company came to me and said, Ken, we don't want to be in the services business anymore. We're gonna take your sales team and we're gonna have them sell this new Facebook product that is gonna try and compete with Wildfire and Buddy Media, which were very entrenched in their existing markets. And then we're gonna slowly divest our interest in the, um, the search management business, basically the agency side. 
So that was essentially getting orders that at some point over a time, those 35, 40 employees were going to be out of a job managing search. We were going to leave the search market and we were going to go to Facebook. So what happened is one hour meeting every day for five days where I basically pleaded with them to not do this. The people had worked really hard for two years to build the team and to build a nice, solid, profitable customer base. And the business was making about a million dollars a year at that point. And at the end of it, he had enough problems elsewhere with cash flow with his other businesses. They said, nope, I'm not doing it. It's Monday, you're gonna roll out this plan, you're gonna let everyone know the changes, and it's gonna be done. So what happened? I called Adam, he was helping uh, run the account services team, and I said, okay, he's kicked us off the cliff, it's time to start our own company. And that took a lot of kind of, I guess, talking through it uh, with each other on how the heck we were gonna go about doing this. It's not like for months we had been planning how this was going to happen. My hand was essentially forced. And we loved the search market. We knew we were running a profitable business. We had really nailed it, and we were covering a lot of ground and gaining market share. And we wanted to continue to do it. I also didn't want all those guys to lose their jobs, to be honest, because we had hired and trained a ton of them. So what we decided to do was be honest. And come Monday, Call the meeting with the CEO of the company. That company was a thousand person company. This guy owned 90% of the company and no one had uh, ever really told him no. He was a very difficult guy to deal with. You'll hear a few more pieces on that in the future. But basically we sat down and said, hey, we understand why you wanna do what you wanna do, but we love search. So we decided that we're gonna go start our own agency. And to be honest, we don't care. You, know, you let us know what's the best way to transition us out. Um, there's four of us that are going to go, and we're happy to stay as long as you guys need us to, whatever plan you would like. And this was, to be honest, against the advice of every advisor that we had, but it was really the only thing that felt good at the time, was to just be honest and not walk away considering all the employees involved. So, what happened? Well, the CEO basically got extremely irritated, and there's a number of different screaming phone calls and meetings, and essentially, um, he asked us to stay for 45 days and their decision was okay if I don't have these guys to divest the interest of the group then it's going to be fire sale time because he's sitting on a bunch of liability because he's got a, he's got a bunch of contracts he has to fulfill so what happened we had to essentially um, move over and sit there and run the company not tell a single employee what was happening for 45 days while he tried to sell the group it was wild experience and in that process you know, we were kind of kicking ourselves, but we finally had to force our hand and say, it's been 45 days, you gotta let us tell people we're leaving. And then he actually brought up selling the company to us. And it's a great story. You see Fairmont 182 right there. Fairmont refers to the Fairmont Hotel in San Francisco. 182 refers to the bill that we had to pay for breakfast that we got invited to by the CEO. <laughs> <laughs> so that was actually the first password in our company for the first year that we had on all the advertising accounts. But basically invited Adam and I in there to talk about selling us the division. And we made an offer to him that we thought was fair based on the liability and the revenue of the group. And he obviously didn't like it very much, mutilated his eggs, then threw his coffee mug down, got up and said, you get the bill and stormed out of the, the hotel. So it was a very wild experience. From there, again, the lawyers got involved. This is where it gets real scary. You know, we were honestly just like, we just want to go start our own company and do our thing. We know we're great at it and we love what we're doing. Well, then we get 10 page letters threatening to sue us every which way sideways. This is where our lawyers, what did they say? Yeah, this is why you don't play nice. You just walk away and you, you leave. And it's no problem and they would have never been able to even bother you guys. And it was all scare tactics. We hadn't broken any laws. We hadn't broken any rules. We were ready to start our own company. We tried to play nice and say so. Boys were given one hour's notice. That basically the two guys in charge of running the whole team were gone. Those 50 employees sat down given one hour's notice that okay these guys will never come back. They all went to a bar and called us and then we went and had drinks with 50 guys and every single one of them asked for a job afterwards. <laughs> but the lesson learned at least from that, that process was that okay if you want to start your own company, if you're somewhere else you may have a fantastic idea. In fact some of the ideas may have come from your time in that company. In fact, a lot of the skills that you've built are going to be things that apply to how you run your company. What we learned in the hard process there was playing nice is not always how everyone else is going to treat you. So for me, in hindsight, yeah, I'm sure we'll start another company in the, in the future when, after we sell this one. 
it's not a matter of uh, ethics. I think it's more of just you have to protect your ass a little bit and make sure that you're not just always doing what feels best or is the least past the res resistance in your mind. After that, we took a full month off because we were all emotionally drained from that process. Okay, so then we decided we were going to start a company. And I want to tell you guys about kind of some of the initial things that right off the bat, you're like, wow, we don't, we hadn't even really thought through all the processes that you're going to have to go through. First up, probably the most interesting conversation you have. If you have partners, you have to discuss equity. Who owns what? Who's going to have what role? How is that chopped up? You think this is a simple conversation? It's not. It's a matter of people feeling what is their worth to the organization. It gets tricky. It takes dip diplomacy, and it also means that you need to figure out really what's the simple way by assessing this. It took us about a week to figure it out. We were all kind of friends outside of the office as well. We've always worked well together, but it's still a big business decision that is going to mean millions down the line. So I will say that that was just a new experience for all of us except for one. One of our partners, Jeff, is a Stanford MBA. He literally has no experience in the search marketing space whatsoever. We had him join just to basically help us with all of the central functions and infrastructure and paperwork and accounting and all that. Next up, honestly, the worst thing you possibly have to go through is the legal stuff. Incorporating in the documentation, I think our LLC agreement is 50 pages. I think we did 50 phone calls with the Jones Day law firm just to go through every damn scenario of what happens along the way. But honestly, I thought at one point it wasn't going to end, and I was like, I don't care what we sign, let's just get it over. <laughs> <laughs> but it's that long of a process. Um, but I have learned as you get kind of further down in the business and you learn more and more stories about our customers and things that those owners have gone through, get it right, even if it's half your budget at the time. Get it right, make sure your paperwork's in order so the company's protected and you're protected of your own interest in the organization. Then. Landing a few old team members. This was really tricky business for us. We had a big giant $200 million firm threatening to sue us. We knew we weren't in the wrong, but anyone can sue anyone for anything. And we knew that a big lawsuit would just sink every last cent of budget that we had thrown together as founders for the organization. We didn't go out and raise any money. It's really difficult to do that for a service-based business. So what we had to do is be really kind of tactful in our process, and we set some ground rules. The ground rules were we don't reach out to a single old employee ever. If they want to speak with us, they need to call us, they need to reach out, and then we can open a conversation with them, and we wanted it documented. If people called my cell phone, I said, nope, I won't speak to you, send me an email. And that way I had it clear that this person had reached out to us, and I didn't want you know, any conversation without it. Um, then there's funding, or in our case, lack thereof. You hear uh, about so many cool stories about people coming up with a great idea, going and pitching a VC, Landing a couple million dollars, getting to go rent a really cool office space, getting to have all the fun stuff in there. That's not the story of us. We bootstrapped the entire thing. We've never taken a single dime. We probably had $100,000 between the four of us to start a company. And that gets really tricky. We did, we did consider raising money. We were going to have to raise money to buy the other organization if we needed to. That would have been easier to do. But I will say on our side, for a service-based business, raising money is almost impossible. Why? Because there's no IP, right? Essentially what you're talking about is delivering services to corporations. It is really around your own kind of know-how and your expertise. So for us, managing funding has been a challenge all the way through our entire process. And it's only been the last year to uh, six months that we're wildly in the green and finally comfortable and we're not going anywhere. Next, technology partner. We use the technology to deliver our services. Yeah. Planning a partnership with them where you have fair prices, when you have zero customers, is really difficult. You have zero leverage, right? You're trying to negotiate down a price on a software that costs generally about a million dollars a year. Yeah, it's really difficult when you have no leverage to bring to the table. So for us, this took us about uh, three weeks and we had to basically lean on all of our past experience at the old agency and kind of show them how quickly we had grown the business and how much revenue that brought to the technology partner and then we were finally able to leverage a deal. Our technology cost, this is for a, uh, a platform called Kenshu, it's a, just a platform we manage all the advertising campaigns through. Right now, it's roughly a million dollars a year. So for us, it was a giant deal, and we knew it could make or break our margins as a business. Um, and then the last and most difficult part is winning customers when you have zero customers. There's probably 1,000 other SEM agencies out there in the US 
it's really difficult to say, yeah, entrust us with your $2 million a year in budget, but we have zero customers for you to talk to. We have zero references for you to uh, look at, and we have the worst looking website that you've ever seen, even though we're a digital company. So that takes a lot of grit. And thankfully, I came from a sales background, and those two girls that were on the previous picture, they were ranked in the top 10 in sales out of 1,000 sales reps at our previous firm. Um, so in the apartment, we had some really good luck, and we landed some of our largest customers, including Citrix Systems, when we were honestly still operating out of an apartment. So those were kind of our initial challenges in the first kind of three to four months of getting up and started. And I'll show you guys a little bit of what our growth has looked like. And it's not the hockey stick story. Why? Because for every 10 new customers we sell, we need to hire somebody else to deliver the services. So we can't scale at an insane rate. And we also don't have millions of dollars in funding to back us up to just hire, hire, hire. But what we have done is we figured out how to scale at a perfectly efficient rate. And that means that our growth rate essentially stays the same over time. And this has been our sales since we started the business. This year we'll probably do eight, eight and a half million dollars as a company. We're three years in, but you can see our growth rate is almost predictable. Same with our FTEs. Like I said, I think we're 51 or 52 today. But we've scaled very steadily over time. We've used every profit that we've ever made from the business, and we've sunk it right back into hiring more employees so that we could sell more customers and essentially grow a big customer base. And yeah, eventually we'll slow down growth a little bit and we'll focus more on selling existing service or selling new services into existing customers. But for right now, this is how we've grown. It's been very steady. Um, it's just been a lot of hard work, but it's not the same sort of story where you can have 4,000 customers with you know 200 employees. It's just not possible. So once we kind of got past that initial stage, I wanted to talk a bit about kind of the challenges in the middle phase of our company. And then at the very end, I'll tell you a bit about the last, uh, last kind of six months, what we've been going through. First up, office space. In my personal experience, it can be extremely fun. The very first one, when you're um, economically shopping, shopping for office space, it's horrible. You're looking for just a box that can actually operate and can bring you the cost that you want. That's very difficult to find in San Francisco. We have an office in Denver as well. Fantastically fun shopping for office space in Denver. It's a quarter of the cost. Everything has huge beam ceiling. Like, it looks like a log cabin everywhere. They have brick in all the buildings. It's beautiful. But in San Francisco, you're honestly looking for a box like this. I think our space was maybe 500 square feet bigger than this. And you don't want to commit to very long. And every single space wants five to six years commitment. And for us, it's like, no, we're, we know we're going to grow. We're going to outgrow this in one year. So office space is a big pain, and you got to spend a lot of time on it. I think that this took half of my time for at least three months to land our deal to get into the right office space. And then you talk about having to dump in $50,000 to put in all the wiring and all the equipment necessary to be able to manage 25 employees. It's a major undertaking. It took, uh, you know, it was honestly like the, I, you know, one of the more uh, difficult scenarios for us to tackle in the first four months. It's only because also none of us were infrastructure guys and we couldn't afford to hire somebody to do that for you. You kind of have to learn as you go. Next, this is a bigger one, is cash flow for hiring. Like I said, we took every single drop of profit and we dumped it into hiring. And what it meant though was that our costs went up every time that we hired and we hired in batches of four or five. But then you're essentially sinking more and more money every single month until you can catch up and fill those new hires with uh, customers that can actually drive more revenue. So for us, it's, you know, when you have that little of cash flow, you're essentially, it's a balancing act at all times. You make sure you never get too tight. You try and find whatever credit is available to give you flexibility in the business. This can be credit cards. It's never going to be a, a bank loan because you need to be in business for three years. And anything else that you're going to get needs to either be friends or family, or you're going to have to go somewhere and give up a big chunk of equity. So for us, we really basically balanced cash and hiring for two years straight. And it was excruciating. You're honestly watching the bank account and dealing with collections in and out every single day. Now we're past all that and we're into the, you know, the nice comfortable breathing room. What it's done though, honestly 100% of the company is owned by the four of us and a big chunk of the employees. And that's really the big benefit we got out of doing that. Next up for us was differentiation. Like I said, there's a thousand SEM agencies in the US. There's even more digital agencies out there. How do you try and claim a competitive advantage when there's that many other competing businesses. Well, one could argue to start, 
all right, if there's a thousand businesses, there's probably pretty good proof of concept that you're running a business that can make money. But then how do you actually start to get entrenched into the larger, bigger players in the space? And I will tell you out of the thousand, there's probably only, I don't know, 50 or 60 that have more than 30 employees. So we've already kind of surpassed the majority of the, the market in size. And the reality is, is for us, all we could do to really differentiate was to A, have a fantastic technology partner, and B, leverage results as our main differentiator. Why do you pay us over another agency? Because we're gonna drive more revenue with your advertising dollars than any other SEM firm out there. And we had to start building case studies and building client references as quickly as possible, because that's what established credibility in our market. We didn't used to have those client slides where we had a lot of great names we could put up there. It's very difficult to convince the C-level exec to hand over the budget when you don't have that behind you. So it's the quicker that you can build that credibility in your market, the quicker you get entrenched, the more deals come and the, the more rapid sales. It's excruciating when it comes to cash, personally. right? You basically sink everything you have. Uh, before we started the company, I had a house in Tahoe that I loved very much. About a year and a half in, I decided to sell that. Um, but honestly, you need to be prepared for that. right? You're going to basically take no salary until your company is producing green and has also produced enough profit to have a huge margin in the bank account for any rainy days. And that took us more than two years. Two years without a single drop of income for you know, a group that was making well above you know, 150 each across all the owners. So it's a big change in lifestyle and something you need to be ready to commit to. And like I said, it came quickly for us. It's not like we planned it for six months. It was something that you know, was challenging for some of the partners. Once we started getting a larger employee base, you, know, you work so hard in the beginning, you worry about all the things around you, particularly money and sales and being able to have the cash available to grow. All of a sudden, there's just this threshold you hit where all, you know, the 15th, 20th employee comes in and you start noticing a few things happening culturally. And you realize, okay, you, know, you, you read all these things about building a proper culture, proper values inside a company. And to be honest, for me, like, yeah, at the old company I was at, I kind of thought it was a bunch of people drinking the Kool-Aid and I never really bought into it that much. And when I started to see the way our employees were differentiating and their perspectives on things and the way they behaved and how they handled decision making, it became really clear that we needed to invest time. And so somewhere around about month nine or 10, we spent about a month ironing out kind of corporate values, general guidance on culture, and we started kind of setting up internal ambassadors to help handle that. Okay, time to we stop here? Yeah, time for questions. All right, you can keep going. We have till um, eight, so. Yeah, we only have 10 minutes. Um, let's yeah. see, what else would be relevant to share? I'll share the, the last piece on uh, kind of the current challenges now that we're three years in. Right here. Okay, so now we're essentially three years in. We got 170 clients. We got plenty of revenue coming in. And honestly, the challenges that we faced in the last year are completely different than we had in the first two years. Um, the first one is figuring out how to basically sell other products, sell other channels, talking about uh, managing Facebook campaigns, display campaigns, things like that. We didn't have that in-house expertise. So we had to go out and make some senior hires with that expertise to be able to sell those additional offerings. Why is that important for us? Well, because we paid a fortune to sales reps to help acquire the customers we do have. And what that means is that the cheapest way to acquire additional revenue growth is to sell new services into our existing customers. That we've already paid all that money to acquire the customer. So what we want to do is we want to sell more services and drive more revenue per customer. And we've done that through Facebook advertising. We probably have 20% of our customers on that product now. And we have somewhere around 10% of them uh, spending display money through us as well. Also, I will say hiring in San Francisco is a bitch. Right? There's a million fantastic companies. There's so many companies out there offering every perk you could possibly imagine. And we're a 50 person company that is trying to extract top talent because honestly our job is difficult. The amount of data analysis, yeah, we pretty much hire from only top schools. And that's really tricky business. You have to pay more than a proper amount of money to win them over. You have to have very clear cut career paths. And you do everything that you can to basically try and offer some sort of version of the perks that the giant companies have. You know, we have every game in the office possible. I built a 16-foot bar inside our office space. Uh, we, we give gym memberships to all of our employees. And you'd be surprised, but those little things matter when it comes to kind of winning over that top talent, which can make or break our business. 
it's very relevant and it's very difficult for us. I will say Denver is a completely different story. You know, in Denver, we are basically the coolest employer in town. Our office space is the <laughs> coolest uh, office space in town. We just won best places to work in Denver. Every single job uh, posting we put up, we have 100 applicants from all three of the surrounding schools. It's literally just pick of the litter over there. So we're going to continue to expand as much as we can in Denver, but all of senior management's in San Francisco, so the larger we get there, it's a little bit more difficult with the remote management. So hiring in San Francisco is a challenge. Next, dialing in profitability. Spend the first two and a half years just acquiring enough customers and enough cash to keep growing. You just push as much growth as you possibly can. Eventually, for a service business, you've got to be conscious of profitability. You have to be able to hone in on, are we really making the margins we need to? If we're going to do $10 million a year in sales, we sure as hell better be able to take home $2 million of that in profit, or we're not doing a good job with our business. And it's tricky dialing in a service business. Some of our big accounts, there's six different employees that are working on it. And you're trying to assess how many hours are they investing on each account every single month? How much revenue does that account drive? And we've had to do a lot of serious work to really dive into the, I guess, operations of the business to figure out profitability. And we have started, I guess, changing our tune with the employee base as well, really making people more conscious of profitability and whether or not the customers we do service are profitable. Also, managing client capacity. Like I mentioned, we have to hire new people to take on new clients. What that means is that it takes us eight months to try and train somebody to the point where they can actually manage an account. So what we do is we have to, the people we hire today, they're going to impact client capacity eight months from now. So we have to be able to plan at least a year ahead on how many clients we're going to be able to hold and how many we think we're going to actually be able to sell. And for us, that's really, really tricky business. And it takes a lot of modeling to figure out, okay, how many people should we hire and when. So that's been a big challenge as of late that we're kind of facing. Um, in, investing in larger infrastructure uh, items, the bigger and bigger you get, the more money you have to spend on 401ks, benefit programs, huge CRM systems, larger accounting systems, billing systems. We're looking at a $100,000 investment right now to bring in an ERP and a CRM software system. You know, when you start a company, you don't even think twice about these things. The bigger you get, the more difficult all the general operations get. And that takes a lot of cash and a lot of time investment from the people at the top of the organization to get all those things set up. So right now we're about three quarters of the way through kind of a scoping plan to do some larger um, kind of central functions investments. And then for us, the last piece is winning larger clients. In our market, we have a ton of customers that have $50,000 to $200,000 a month budgets. And these customers pay us anywhere from five to $20,000 a month. The biggest agencies that we compete with, they're after the customers that are spending a million dollars a month. And we have one of those. We want as many of those as possible. That takes establishment and credibility in your space. And that takes also more senior people internally. So for us, we're trying to make a few pivots just by hiring more outside talent and also figuring out how much we need to invest in building our brand as metric theory in order to have, you know, be able to resonate more effectively with the top customers and be able to win those people over. So those are kind of the current things that myself and the other partners are working on. Um, you know, we've been through a lot in the last three years, but I honestly, I think it's been the best three years of my life. There were just some really difficult uh, steps along the way. And I wish that, you know, I had more friends that had started a company at the time to give me a little bit of guidance because now we have some good advisors and yeah, they're worth their weight in gold. They, they help you, you know, avoid all the major missteps that can cost you guys a ton of money. So that's my story. Questions? We have zero minutes. Sure. Since so much of your business is related to Google, has Google